Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Diagnostic Dilemma of Mild Traumatic Brain Injury in the Emergency Department. I am Antonina Salcido of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Abbott. To learn more, please visit corelaboratory.abbott. We encourage you to participate today by submitting as many questions as you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Dr. Peter Bibertaler, Chair, Department for the Trauma Surgery at Technical University, Munich, Germany. Dr. Bibertaler, you may now begin your presentation. Antonia, thank you very much for this very friendly introduction. And ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to uh, illuminate the diagnostic dilemma of uh, minor traumatic brain injury in an emergency department. My name is Peter Wiebertaler. I'm the head of the trauma department of the Technical University in Munich. And by that, I have to take care of the trauma patients in our emergency department. So this is a little different organized as compared to uh, the United States. So um, what, what is the uh, diagnostic dilemma of mild traumatic brain injury? And um, well, these are my disclosures, of course. And uh, these are the aims of, uh, of our talk. So I will give you a short introduction into the topic. And then uh, we will flip through the actual standard of diagnostic. And then I will give you an overview of uh, studies uh, concerning biochemical markets so far and a short outlook into the future. So what's the matter with traumatic brain injury? Um, the point is that um, it's not very clear defined. So um, uh, as you can see here, um, the, the major definition is regarding to the Glasgow Coma Scale. So if you have a minor um, traumatic brain injury, it's defined as a Glasgow Coma Scale of 15 points, and it's the same as a concussion injury. And then you have the mild between 13 and 15 points, and the moderate between 9 and 12 points, and severe below 9 points. However, um, if you have less GCS points, uh, then your um, neurological impairment can do worse. So what's, what's about this Glasgow Coma Scale? I, I show you how it's comprised. So it's, it's a, a, a simple clinical scale, and uh, it comprises uh, a verbal response, and an eye response, and a motoric response. In the verbal response, you get five points, on eye response, four points, and motoric response, six points, and altogether this is 15 points. And as you can see here, um, uh, the neurological um, uh, function is um, something which has been identified at a time when imaging was not widely distributed. So the Glasgow Coma Scale was established before computer tomography was widely distributed. It's a purely clinical risk stratification tool and it's not matching very nicely to modern imaging preferences. This picture depicts the anatomical basics. So our brain is pretty nice protected by the skull around of the brain. However, if you have any type of intracranial pressure increase, it can't escape. So what is happening, and you can see here uh, the look from from uh, from downside, what is happening is if you have an increase of pressure, the brain is pressed against its natural anatomic um, frontiers. What does this mean? As you can see here, um, this means that the neurological cells are not able to take their function anymore if they are pressed against these um, frontiers. So this means if you have an intracranial pressure increase, your brain is not able to keep up its neurological function. Why then are clinical symptoms so unspecific? Um, this 
is depicted in this slide. So you do not only have brain volume in your uh, skull, you also have fluid, of course, arterial volume, and venous volume, and liquor. And if you have an increase of intracranial pressure by a bleeding, for example, first of all, all of those liquid fluids are pressed out of the skull. And this means that you have a period of compensating intracranial pressure until you really have an increase of pressure on neuron cells. So um, this um, is depicted by this slide. So if you have an increase of intracranial pressure given on the y-axis, and the increase of intracranial volume on the x-axis, you can see that even with a substantial increase in the initial phase, the intracranial pressure is not increasing very much. However, if you overrun the compensation systems, then the neurological deterioration is happening pretty fast. And this is the reason why the neurological symptoms uh, given in the Glasgow Coma Scale are so unspecific because they react in a time point when the biological compensation systems are completely overrun. So as you can see here in this picture, I will show you that the, the phases before this overrun of compensation systems can be detected by imaging or even earlier by biomarkers. So far, imaging is the only rule-out technology of intracranial pathologies. As you can see here, those intracranial pathologies are named uh, like epidural or subdural or suprarachnoidal bleeding. All of them lead to an increase of intracranial pressure. However, the gap between good and bad is pretty small. As you can see here, this patient has the typical clinical appearance with Rancoon eyes, but he has a Glasgow coma of 15, and he has a small epidural hematoma. However, if you have a look on the next slide, you see that this patient is already brain dead. So the, the frontier between good and bad is pretty small. However, the majority of patients um, fortunately, do have a mild traumatic brain injury. So this is the reason why in all emergency departments of the world, these patients do cause a substantial diagnostic problem. Because the symptoms are pretty unspecific. And only 3 to 15% of those patients do have intracranial complications. However, if you have intracranial complications, even if you present with a Glasgow coma of 13, 15, 14, or 15 points in the beginning, the outcome is still as bad as if you have an initial Glasgow coma below 13 points. So this is our diagnostic problem. And this is the reason why it's so difficult with traumatic brain injury. So the gold standard Glasgow coma scale is very subjective. And the gap between good and bad outcome is extremely narrow. The numbers are high, and the majority of those patients do have uh, mild traumatic brain injury. The symptoms are extremely unspecific. And so far, imaging is the only secure rule of technology. I want to show you some data um, how the indication for this imaging technology was identified. And um, this paper is one of the most famous ones by Michelle Heidel out of New Orleans. And she identified several risk factors um, given in this slide, which uh, drive the indication for a CT scan after minor head injury. And if we have a look on the left-hand side, on the symptoms, you see here short-term memory deficits, drug or alcohol intoxication. Well, in fact, this means in our emergency department, we might scan half of the emergency department during a Friday night. Then physical evidence of trauma above the clavicles, uh, age above 60 years, 
So you can see these are risk factors which were identified significantly with bad intracranial um, uh, pathologies, so it draw the indication for a CT scan. And then it was analyzed how many patients um, do really have intracranial pathologies, and she demonstrated that it's something around 6.3%. So this means if you apply these clinical rules, you do uh, almost 94% without finding intracranial pathologies. This is the Canadian CT uh, head rule, um, also trying to identify clinical factors which might be able to um, give a better indication for the CT scan. And you can see here the result. So these were the clinical risk factors identified by the, by the Canadian group. So they, they, they thought that Glasgow coma between 13 and 15 points loss of consciousness, amnesia, and disorientation might be a good indication. However, they still have a high frequency of negative scans of approximately 90%. And these are the East Practice Management Guideline rules. And you can see here, uh, these are the clinical factors which will draw um, the indication for initial um, uh, CT scan in, in mild traumatic brain injury patients. But if you have a thorough look on this, um, in practical medical use, this might mean that you scan almost everybody in the emergency department after, after head trauma. Because these are our typical patients, and this is the problem that the majority of them are intoxicated or even worse, they don't want to have a CT scan. So um, what do we do with those patients? Um, so we might go for um, sedation and intubation, and they are not sober. So in the clinical setting, this is really a pretty problematic situation, and every emergency physician in the world knows this. So the indication for the, for the CT scan um, of course, if you have a Glasgow coma below 13 points, there's no question. Then you always go for a scan. If you are between 13 and 15 points, the indication is risk depending. If you have symptoms such as amnesia, vomiting, pain, seizure, etc. Okay, now you're experts. And we try to get for a more interactive quiz. Um, let's go through this. This patient female, 53 years old. She has an accident with another bicyclist. Glasgow coma is 15 points. And if you ask her, have you been unconsciousness? She says, I don't know. No vomiting, no nausea. So um, what does this mean if she says, I don't know if I was unconsciousness? Well, this means most probably she was. Who wants to have a CT scan? Well, I give you a little bit more information for this. So this is the poll. Who wants to have a CT scan? And this was her bicycle helm. And I have a nice gathering of cracked bicycle helms, so I just can recommend you if you drive bicycle, use a helmet. And you can see here how the helmet has been cracked. And this is her scan. She has a very small subdural hematoma, but requires no neurosurgical performance. So in this case, it was correct. Then our next patient, typical emergency department patient during the weekend, male, 53, fall from a bar stool, initially no motion, he has a big hematoma, he opens his eyes on demand, he's heavily intoxicated and says very bad words to the staff. So who wants to have a CT scan in this patient? Ah, uh, I think everybody wants to have a CT scan in this patient, but the problem is the patient does not want to have a CT scan. So what do we do now? Go, do we go for sedation, intubation, think about the aspiration risk, and so forth? So in this situation, put this patient to the scanner is pretty high risk. However, I think everybody of us is agreeing that Probably it would be a good idea. So this is the poll. You can answer yes or no. 
and this is his scan. And as you can see here, he has a, a, a bleeding temporal and he requires neurosurgical surgery. So another patient, this guy, 85 year old, he stumbled over his Persian carpet at home, has a laceration, no medication. So he's above 85, so according to the rules, who wants to have a CT scan? You can give the poll here. Who wants to have the CT scan? Yes, here's the scan, but he has no intracranial pathology. So let me take this together. TBI diagnosis is pretty subjective. If you do this to clinical symptoms, it's extremely subjective. So taken together, um, minor TBI patients with a Glasgow of 13 to 15 points is one of the central diagnostic problems in emergency departments all over the world. Management only by clinical factors is extremely insufficient. And this is inducing a high frequency of unnecessary CT scans. Of course, radiation and costs. Moreover, um, this is causing a substantial logistic problem to the staff by scanning all of those 13 to 15 point patients. So, minor traumatic brain injury has a risk stratification problem. So our scientific efforts focused on an identification, identification of an additional quantitative examiner independent factor to help improve this risk stratification for minor traumatic brain injured patients. This is what we were trying to solve scientifically. So we thought that probably we might be able to find a more sensitive and quantitative parameter which might allow identification of patients with intracranial pathologies even before their clinical symptoms start to deteriorate. So these were the key hurdles. Will we have an accurate indication of, of traumatic brain injury or concussion? And uh, will we be able to have this within those given time periods for different patient collectives? And will we have an adequate comparison to baseline levels? Now, I will demonstrate you some studies. So as you can see here, these biomarkers are currently under investigation. So we have the S100, the UCHL1, and the GFAP. All the others are more experimental investigated on. So what's the S100? It's an astrocyte protein, and the theory is that if you have a crack on your head, the blood-brain barrier is opening very shortly, and then this protein is washed out to the systemic circulation where it can be measured. There were some early studies in the 2000 years uh, where uh, from the neurosurgeons, um, S100 was measured on patients and they were very promising. However, uh, those numbers were far too low to change clinical decision rules, of course. So we planned our study. Uh, we wanted to identify a safe and effective cutoff level to rule out intracranial lesions. And our statistical targets were sensitivity above 99% because, of course, uh, what we what we really do not want to have is a patient which we oversee any kind of intracranial pathology. This was the planning. It was a multicentric prospective study, and the study collective contained healthy volunteers. And then our study group, um, minor head injured group with a Glasgow coma of 13 to 15 points and risk factors, and a positive control group with Glasgow coma patients below 13 points. All patients received the gold standard scan in the emergency department and as a biomarker, the S100 was measured on the Roche machine. These are the numbers. So first of all, we identified 540 healthy volunteers to get a good cutoff value. And then we uh, enrolled more than 1,300 patients with a glacial coma of 13 to 15 points. 
and 93 patients in the positive control group. Oh, sorry. And, uh, 93 of those patients had a positive CT scan and 1,216 a negative CT scan. And uh, in the positive control group, we had 55 patients with a glacial coma below 13 points. This is our publication um, out of this study. And here you can see uh, the graph. Uh, first of all, on the top, you see the control collective where we identified the cutoff level. And we identified the cutoff level of 0 0.1 micrograms per liter. And if we apply this to the study collective, we found that one third of the CT negative patients were below this cutoff. And uh, almost all patients with a positive CT scan were above the cutoff level. Uh, this is the ROC curve of this, and as you can see, the parameter is able to distinguish pretty nicely between um, between um, intracranial uh, bleeding or not. However, you might ask yourself, what about the patients uh, which do have an uh, elevated S100 level but a negative CT scan? Well, the problem is that also, the CT scan is the gold standard in the emergency department. Uh, the detection level um, and the technique which is done there routinely is that you see small spots not if they are smaller than two millimeters. So what we did is we did a subgroup analysis and put those patients after an elevated S100 and a negative CT scan additionally to the MRI scanner. And what we saw is that in, those, in this group, 30% had significant MRI signs of injury. So um, our specificity problem of the, of the parameter is not a real specificity problem. It's a problem of the gold standard. And uh, then I want to introduce you to this study. So this was a prospective multi-center study where um, GFAB concentrations were analyzed in, in uh, MRI. And as you can see here, um, uh, it was analyzed if in patients with a glass coma of 13 to 15 points and a positive or a negative CT scan, alterations in an additional MRI scan were seen. And what you can see here is that in a substantial percentage of patients with a negative CT scan, I secondary positive MRI scan was achieved. So our specificity shoulder, as I call it here, is pretty nicely explained by the gold standard problem. So the uh, group around Hugh uh, concluded that biomarkers are probably more sensitive than a CT but uh, the gold standard is the problem of all of those studies. And this is what I want to show you with this graph, which I have shown before. So if those patients do have intracranial bleeding um, and they, they demonstrate um, symptoms, then the compensating uh, sy systems are already overrun. Before that, you might be able to identify those patients using imaging. But even before that, you might be able to identify those patients using biomarkers. Then we were asked, what about intoxication? Because so many patients are intoxicated if they have uh, intracranial, uh, if they have um, minor traumatic brain injury. So what we did is we did a study on intoxicated patients and uh, analyzed if there was an influence of alcohol on the S100. And as you can see here, this is the blood alcohol level in our study groups. On the left-hand side, you see the patient with, a, with an uh, average alcohol of 1.8. And you see the study group of our non-traumatized, um, uh, mild intoxication patients and the heavy intoxication patients who wanted to withdraw from alcohol. And this is the result of the S100 measurement in this, these collectives. As you can see here, the only factor which leads to an increase of S100 was the fact of a positive CT scan. All other, um, all other groups did not have an 
significant increase of F100. This means that alcohol has not an influence in this respective. So um, I want to show you um, if our data was uh, reproduced by other centers. This is always important in the scientific community. And as you can see here, the Norwegian group around Müller and Tromsø, they demonstrated almost similar results uh, with a threshold of 0 0.13 of the S100 on their collective. And another center in Japan did almost the same. And they also demonstrated very nice, um, very nice results, which um, showed that our results were reproduced in other centers. So um, these results led to implementation of uh, the measurement of biomarkers in the clinical routine. So this was the publication of the American College of Emergency Physicians of 2008. And as you can see here, there's a recommendation, a level C recommendation in mild traumatic brain injured patient without significant extracranial injuries and the S100 lower than 0 0.1. Um, you might be able to uh, postpone a, a CT scan. However, in these days, this factor was not um, approved in the United States. Uh, but the measurement of biomarkers also uh, was able to were taken into the Scandinavian guidelines, as you can see here. So um, uh, this measurement is already partially used in clinical routine. So now I want to uh, demonstrate you some other markers who were investigated on. You can see here those names. For example, the tau protein, this was an analysis on hockey players. However, you see that there is not a real good significant increase. And on the right hand side, although I know that the uh, neurospecific amylase is in the guidelines of, um, of neurological um, intensive care patients in the uh, minor traumatic brain injury setting, it obviously has not such a significant impact. So these are two markers which are more promising, though the GFAP and the UCHL1 on this picture depicts where they are coming from. And uh, I, I, I received this slide um, from, from the US Army. Uh, thank you for this because they started the studies very early, as you can see here. Um, so they did a feasibility study on those markers, and I will be able to share the contents with you. As you can see here, um, the UCHL1 and the GFAB were significantly increased in traumatic brain injured patients. Uh, and this is the ROC curve regarding those markers. As you can see, there is a significant discrimination of intracranial pathologies by these markers. So starting from this, we went to the ALERT TBI study. Um, we wanted to analyze if the UCHL1 and GFAB were able to, um, to detect patients suffering from intracranial pathologies after traumatic brain injury. So what we did, we planned this sample. And again, um, we wanted to have a very high test sensitivity. This is the publication of this study um, done by um, a multi-center, multinational group. And I can show you all the centers. So most of them were in the United States, but one in Hungary and several in Germany. So this was the planning of the study. Um, uh, the planning was that we wanted to identify um, if GFAB and UCH1 were able to identify those patients um, which were at risk after traumatic brain injury. And uh, this were the primary objective. So as you can see here, we enrolled patients with a Glasgow coma of 13 to 15 points to um, uh, obtain our study goals. 
This were the study profile. As you can see here, this were the three of the patients where they were enrolled. And this were the findings. So um, 1,920 patients were evaluable with a Glasgow coma of 14 to 15 points. From these, 5.9% um, uh, had detected intracranial injuries and 0.5 required a neurosurgical intervention. So um, in, in this collective, the test performance was pretty good. So the sensitivity was 97.3 and uh, the negative predictive value was 99.5. So you can see here um, that uh, the specificity and the sensitivity was extremely good uh, in this study. Uh, moreover, we analyzed um, when those patients came uh, to our emergency department, and as you can see here, um, most of them came uh, in between the first four hours, so this was the critical time point where we wanted to identify those patients um, uh, after traumatic brain injury. So the conclusions, um, the, the um, GFAB and UCHO1 was able to identify patients uh, and rule out uh, more than one-third of patients with a negative CT scan. And all neurosurgical lesions were identified by the test. So from this, um, uh, future research was um, suggested. So um, the, those markers were um, asked if they could be um, analyzed on POC platforms and a clinical rule-in test um, should be developed. These were the, the investigators of this study. And uh, then I want to show you uh, a very nice review which was recently published um, about the UCHL1, the GFAB. Uh, as you can see here, this is the time point of uh, the release of those markers. And as you can see, um, not all markers are released at uh, the similar time point, so it's important to know when the traumatic event happened, so you know uh, how, in which phase of your elevation curve uh, your marker will be. Um, so this is the most recent review concerning um, biomarkers, and you can see here the study demo diagram, and you can see here uh, the distribution of GFAB and UCHL1 in subjects um, with Glasgow coma of 13 to 15 points. So um, you can see again that those markers do have a very nice performance uh, detecting intracranial pathologies. And the characteristics of the fault negative subject you can see here, um, all of those do not require neurosurgical intervention. So let me take together. Um, I showed you why minor traumatic brain injury is a real diagnostic dilemma. And the clinical risk factors are extremely subjective. So far, imaging is the only rule out technology in those patients, but biomarkers are extremely promising. So far, the S100 is the best characterized, but the UCHL1 and the GFAB um, demonstrated that they even give better results. I personally think the, the solution will be a panel, and I want to thank you for your attention, and I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bibberteller, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Now let's get started. Our first question is, what are the challenges in the utilization of the CDRs during the assessment of patients in the ED? 
Well, the problem is what I wanted to demonstrate to you with my uh, clinical cases is that the clinical decision rules are um, are pretty subjective. So if you um, calculate a Glasgow coma scale uh, from those patients, um, uh, the the measurement of this Glasgow coma scale um, has a problem that it's depending very much from the experience of the physician and from the intoxication situation and probably from other factors um, but not so much from intracranial pathologies. This means that if you use um, the clinical risk factors as an indication for the CT scan, the problem is that you will have a very high number of negative CT scans. Great. Thank you for that answer. Um, another question we have, what do you see as the major hurdle for potential widespread implementation of TBI biomarkers? I think um, the, the biggest problem will be the fact that physicians are used to positive testing strategies. So if you have a marker and it's above a threshold level, then this generally is um, identified as pathologic. Um, in this uh, setting of the biomarkers of intracranial pathologies, um, it's a, a, a rule out parameter, which means that um, if you have a patient with a negative uh, biomarker test, then you can be sure that there is no intracranial pathology. And all other patients with a potential positive biomarker test, you might um, manage like you managed those patients before. So if you do that, you might be able to reduce the number of unnecessary CT scans about at least one third. Thank you. Um, and our next question, what were the challenges or lack of full implementation of S100B? Well, the same I just mentioned. The problem <laughs> was that it was, it, was, um, it was widely distributed to emergency physicians and um, they they used it probably uh, very widely and um, they found, um, as I showed you, that the two-thirds um, are above the threshold level. So they thought, well, this parameter is not discriminating very well. However, I personally think it was a um, teaching problem of implementation of the parameter. Because um, if you teach the emergency physicians that it's a rule out parameter and it helps to improve the indication for the CT scan, this um, will uh, help the emergency physician a lot. Great, and we have time for about one more question. Um, so our last question, will implementation of these new technologies have an impact on emergency physicians and patients' length of stay in the ED? Absolutely. I'm absolutely convinced that um, if you measure those biomarkers uh, and it's negative, uh, then you can uh, treat this patient um, like you did before. You probably stitch his wound and give him a tetanus vaccination and after this he can go and he can be sure that there is no risk of intracranial pathology. And if he falls again on his head during this night, um, you have a quantitative parameter which uh, very clearly demonstrates that when he was in your hands, there was no risk. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. River Toller. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Um, thank you for listening, and um, I'm looking forward for all of those new biomarkers for the diagnostic of uh, minor traumatic brain injury. Great. Thank you again for your time today and your important research. We'd also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Abbott, for underwriting today's educational webcast.
Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. And we encourage you to share that email with any colleagues or friends who have, may have missed today's live event. Thank you. Until next time, goodbye.